Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of God Emperor of Dune by Frank Herbert. So I think this is the fourth book in the series. Yes, it is. The fourth in the Dune sequence. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... More than a millennium has passed since the first events recorded in Dune. One link only survives with that epic past, Leto Atreides, God Emperor of the Galaxy. He alone it is who understands the future, who knows with a terrible certainty that the evolution of his race is at an end unless he can breed new qualities into the species. Yet he knows also that these new and vital forces can only prove themselves through the fateful process of his own destruction. Dun dun dun. It doesn't mention on the back of this. He's, he's half, he's basically turned into a sandworm, apart from his head. And so here, uh, uh, there's a literary device as well throughout, we get excerpts from his uh, stolen journals. And um, we get this here. The following is from the Hadi Bonotto translation of the volumes discovered at Dar es Balat. I was born Leto Atreides II more than 3,000 standard years ago, measuring from the moment when I caused these words to be printed. My father was Paul Mardib. My mother was his Fremen consort, Charney. My maternal grandmother was Farula, a noted herbalist among the Fremen. My paternal grandmother was Jessica, a product of the Bene Gesserit breeding scheme in their search for a male who could share the powers of the sisterhood's reverend mothers. My maternal grandfather was Liet Kine, the planetologist who organised the ecological transformation of Arrakis. My paternal grandfather was the Atreides, descendant of the house of Atreus and tracing his ancestry directly back to the Greek original. Enough of these bagats. And um, computers are prohibited by the Great Convention, although there may be a little bit of flexibility there when it comes to uh, the God Emperor. And uh, we get this note uh, on hydraulic despotism, which I thought was fascinating. So, Reverend Mother Siaxa has proposed a theoretical explanation for this trend, a theory which many of us are beginning to share. RM Siaxa attributes to Lord Leto a motive based on the concept of hydraulic despotism. As you know, hydraulic despotism is possible only when a substance or condition upon which life in general absolutely depends can be controlled by a relatively small and centralised force. The concept of hydraulic despotism originated when the flow of irrigation water increased local human populations to a demand level of absolute dependence. When the water was shut off, people died in large numbers. And all throughout June, I've really enjoyed looking at how uh, water is used like symbolically. Uh, Leto has lots of great quotes. So, for example, he says, This damnable religion should end with me, Leto shouted. Why should I want to lose a religion upon my people? Religions wreck from within. Empires and individuals alike, it's all the same. You got this, let us proceed, Leto said. Manea realised that he had missed something. He came out of his reverie and looked at a smiling Duncan Idaho. We used to call that wall gathering, Leto said. Charlie Heathcote here on Booktube calls it wall gathering as well. So here's a quote from the Stolen Journals, which kind of refers back to our own world. Our ancestor, Asun Nasir Apli, who was known as the cruelest of the cruel, seized the throne by slaying his own father and starting the reign of the sword. His conquests included the Urumia Lake region, which led him to Kamajni and Kabur. His son received tribute from the Shuites, from Tyr, Sidon, Gebel, and even from Jehu, son of Omri, whose very name struck terror into thousands. The conquests which began with Asun Nasir Apli carried arms into Medea and later into Israel, Damascus, Edom, Arpad, Babylon, and Omnias. Does anyone remember these names and places now? I've given you enough clues. Try and name the planet. And uh, here's Leto again talking about because as I say, it's kind of turned into a giant sandworm pretty much. He says, I feel the vanished parts of myself. I can feel my legs, quite unremarkable and so real to my senses. I can feel the pumping of my human glands, some of which no longer exist. I can even feel genitalia, which I know intellectually vanished centuries ago. Same mate. I'm just interesting here. Um, Leto says there have been fads in smells. Lucille's hand hesitated. Perfumes and essences, he said. I remember them all, even the courts of the non-smells are mine. People have used underarm sprays and crotch sprays to mask their natural odours. Did you know that? Of course you knew it. Antiak's gaze moved towards Lucille. Neither woman dared speak. People knew instinctively that their pheromones betrayed them, Leto said. Another great quote from Leto. He's basically like Herbert's mouthpiece for reflecting our own world, you know? Men are susceptible to class fixations. They create layered societies. The layered society is an ultimate invitation to violence. It does not fall apart. It explodes. And a lot of this book is kind of investigating the idea of a benevolent tyrant, tyrant, I guess. Like he does tyrannical things, but ultimately he's trying to save the species. It's a bit of a grey area. Is he a bad guy? Is he a good guy? He's probably, probably mostly bad to be fair, but there's a little bit of good as well. We get this, which is a great quote. Bravery can be so foolish, she whispered, and vice versa. And then later on we get, your attention wonders, Lord. You do not have to conceal that from me. I would betray myself before I would betray you. 
You think I'm wool-gathering? What gathering, Lord? Maneo had never questioned this word earlier, but now. Leto explained the illusion, thinking, how ancient! The looms and shuttles clicked in Leto's memory. Animal fur to human garments, huntsman to herdsman, the long steps up the ladder of awareness. And now they must make another long step, longer even than the ancient ones. So uh, here we get, Lord, Maneo pressed, are you wool gathering? Ah, he likes that new word. Yes he does, Charlie, yes he does. We get this great little, this is just full of little quotes that can be taken out of context that made me laugh. Uh, but your woman won't let me fight every time I want to go where... Uh, do you question that you're more valuable alive than dead? Lisa made a clucking sound. Baka! Then, use your wits, Duncan. That's what I value. And my sperm, we value that. Your sperm is your own to put where you wish. We get this exchange. Love, he said, and it was a bitter sound. She said, my Uncle Malky used to say that love was a bad bargain because you get no guarantees. Your Uncle Malky was a wise man. He was stupid. Love needs no guarantee. And we get this, which I've read somewhere else as well, and I can't remember who said it, but... Well, basically it says, uh, Maneo spoke in a soothing tone, but his words shook Idaho. I will tell you this only once. Homosexuals have been among the best warriors in our history, the berserkers of last resort. They were among our best priests and priestesses. Celibacy was no accident in religions. It is also no accident that adolescents make the best soldiers. Uh, because it's a theory that there's like a perverted displacement of sex into pain. I don't know about that, but I have read somebody similar saying something similar that... I, I think though there, the argument I saw before was that uh, homosexuals were good soldiers because basically their life's been made so, so hellish that they feel like they've got nothing to lose. And then and again another quote, just out of context, sounds weird. Malky took a moment to recover from pain then... Tell me, old worm, is there a monster penis hidden in that monster body of yours? What a shock for the gentle weed. I'll tell, I told you the truth about that long ago, Leto said. And uh, this great little passage here. He said, you think that in a world without birds, men would not invent aircraft. What a fool you are. Men can invent anything. He called you a fool. There was shock in Reed's voice. He was right, and although he denied it, he spoke the truth. He told me that there was a reason for running away from inventions. Then you fear the Ixians. Of course I do, they can invent catastrophe. Then what could you do? Run faster. History is a constant race between invention and catastrophe. Education helps, but it's never enough. You must also run. And one final quote here. Is Maneo your friend too? We are friends of the stomach. We both like yogurt. Deep. So, God Emperor of June by Frank Herbert. Uh, this is probably, probably my favorite entry in the June series so far. Um, I feel as though the series just keeps getting better and better. The first book actually had like 200 pages where it felt like nothing happened. They were just knocking around in the desert. By this point, all of the world building's done so it can be a lot more action, but with that political intrigue as well. Um, the ending was kind of obvious how it was going to end, but I don't know how it's going to continue. So it's made me want to pick up the next book, which is, uh, what is it? I did look this up earlier and I've forgotten already. Heretics of June? Heretics of June. So I will read that soon. But overall I gave this a 4 out of 5. Very happy. We'll continue reading June. And uh, here's my June tattoo. So there we have it. That's what I made of God Emperor of June by Frank Herbert. As always don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Biggie also says bye. He's by my feet.